closing phase of our, our past 22 program. We'll start off by introducing uh, Laura Gregori, who's chair of the Price HPC Excellence uh, Committee, and she'll introduce our, our award-winning speaker. And after that, we'll have a closing and awards ceremony. So, Laura, welcome. Thank you, Lois, for the introduction. And I'm really pleased today to introduce the winner of our uh, Praise HPC Excellence Award, so the first edition. And uh, the winner is Nicola Marzari and his team from EPFL in Switzerland. And he is going to present the work for which they received the award, which is around novel two-dimensional materials from the computational exfoliation of all known compounds. So let me introduce Nicola. Nicola holds the chair of theory and simulation of materials at EPFL, where he is also the director of the National Center for Computational Design and Discovery of Novel Materials, and heads the Laboratory of Material Simulations at the Paul Scherer Institute. He previously had appointments, at, uh, including the Toyota Chair of Material Processing at MIT, the first statutory chair of materials modeling at the University of Oxford, and he got his laureate degree in physics from the University of Trieste and a PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge. And with this, Nicola, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Laura, and thank uh, Praise for uh, uh, this great honor. It's always very humbling uh, when you receive one of these prizes and you think uh, you're not worth it, and I'm actually not worth it, so, but uh, the, team, uh, the team was great. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, what, uh, what uh, we have uh, been doing and uh, what we have done, so that the talk will be very much about uh, the work that was uh, kindly chosen uh, by the award committee and also the work that has stemmed uh, from that. And uh, I'll actually sort of, you know, uh, pay tribute to some uh, uh, um, great uh, Greek scientists. And uh, Aristotle actually starts uh, his book of uh, uh, poetics uh, saying uh, uh, we should uh, begin first uh, with first principles. Uh, and actually, this morning I was looking for a high resolution uh, image of this. This is the School of Athens by Raphael in the Vatican. And I realized for the first time that there is a citation here. Actually, you see, this should be Plato, but it's actually Leonardo da Vinci with the finger of John the Baptist pointing. So also old master would cite each other. Uh, so very much about first principle. What are first principle simulation? Is really computational quantum mechanics. And uh, I you know, highlight uh, four goals uh, for this field. We use it to understand, uh, predict, and design materials and devices. You'll see a lot of this today. Uh, but we can also use them to actually suggest novel physical theories in our quest uh, to get macroscopic properties from microscopic descriptions. Uh, more and more, uh, we try to support a uh, streamline and inspire experimental efforts. Actually, you have seen my affiliation these days is also the Paul Scherer Institute, where there is a major effort in integrating computational scientific computing and theory and data into the experimental landscape, and very much also to accelerate scientific discovery and technological innovation. So really, the first and the fourth points is some of what you'll see today. And computational quantum mechanical Computational quantum mechanics is having a major impact in the world of uh, science and technology these days. Already eight years ago, Nature looked at the most cited papers in the entire story of our scientific literature, but also medical engineering. And actually, density functional theory, that is probably the workhorse of computational quantum mechanics, uh, was uh, the most represented field, uh, 12 papers in the top 100 and two in the top 10. And if we even go to the physical sciences, I take this example uh, from the journals of the American Physical Society, Physical Review, Physical Review Letters, Review of Modern Physics, and so on. And again, looking at citations that you know, are not a measure of intellectual impact, but are certainly uh, a measure of uh, you know, broader impact in the community. And everything is in red is about uh, uh, density functional theory and computational quantum mechanics. So uh, it's actually you know, six, 18 papers uh, out of, uh, out of uh, 20. Uh, 
of course, and you know, I don't have to convince you, uh, we benefit uh, by this uh, fantastic high performance computing uh, ecosystem that you know, has given us the most remarkable acceleration ever in the history of mankind. I mean, you know, in 30 years, uh, this is just an example from my first ever first principle simulation in 1993 that happily coincides with the top 500 uh, chart. Uh, we have had a three million fold uh, increase. And a uh, few years ago, just before COVID, I give uh, uh, this uh, talk on computation and quantum mechanics to a group of uh, 30 Wall Street billionaires. So I didn't say three million fold increase, I said 100% growth every 16 months. They were all asleep and they all opened their eyes and they started listening at this, at this point. And uh, of course, this is, uh, you know, classical digital computational science, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe quantum computing, neuromorphic computing uh, will also bring, uh, you know, alternative and powerful routes. And uh, these days, you know, we are becoming uh, so confident uh, that, uh, you know, there is this sense, uh, I use the word materials revolution from this uh, American technology uh, magazine, uh, you know, arguing how powerful simulation technique, increased computing power, machine learning, are enabling researchers to automate much of the discovery process, accelerating the development of new materials. And this is exactly what you'll see today. Uh, the three technologies uh, that should create a trillion dollar markets, by the way, um, are uh, machine learning, uh, CRISP-9, genetic editing, and uh, novel, novel materials. And uh, materials, actually, if you sort of sit back for a moment and think, uh, um, are really key to what I call societal well-being. I think it's easy um, these days, actually, to think at you know, all the energy challenges that we're going to face uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few months. Uh, but really, materials and materials breakthrough uh, are uh, at the origin of all the novel technologies that we have for harvesting, converting, storing energy, uh, or even just using less energy, being uh, more efficient. Uh, so, you know, these top two lines on energy and environmental protection are really key, you know, societal challenges for which uh, we need uh, breakthroughs. But, you know, broadly speaking, our entire society relies on material, say, for what I call the high-tech and high-value industries uh, that are very common in Europe, in Switzerland, here, uh, where we transform materials uh, into technology enablers uh, that give us, uh, you know, the power uh, for our economy. And then it's a long list, but, you know, if we go to the end, uh, fundamental science uh, is often driven by novel materials that pose challenges uh, to our theories that we need to answer. And uh, experimental science, uh, you just have to, you know, go down to CERN in Geneva and find uh, the, you know, huge uh, superconducting coils uh, that, uh, that bend the beams uh, of uh, LHCs enabled uh, by novel materials. So we are going to look at materials and we are going to look at materials with quantum mechanical simulations. And uh, if we want uh, you know, to leverage uh, all of this, we need to make sure that our simulations are accurate enough, uh, they capture the complexity of the real world, uh, and these days they leverage uh, all the, say, technologies and ideas and tools uh, uh, that uh, computer science has given us, uh, what I call materials uh, informatics. So just to give you, you know, a graphical feeling of uh, what we can do these days, I'll just show you a few slides uh, to get a sense. This is actually a fun Swiss project uh, where we were working with the watch industry uh, to actually be able to predict uh, the color of a material. And uh, it might seem trivial, but there is actually a lot of uh, science and physics in it. Uh, you need to understand how photons uh, excite electrons uh, uh, across bands, uh, interbands, uh, they excite uh, plasmons, and you want to calculate, in this case, uh, uh, the optical reflectivity in the long wavelength limit, understand uh, what is, uh, say, the frequency response uh, of your retina, and at the end uh, you get the color of a material, and what you have on top uh, is what we predict, and what you have on the bottom is what you see in an experiment. But of course, uh, once, uh, you're once you're able to predict it, uh, you know, then your capability of exploring uh, novel materials uh, uh, proceeds uh, at the speed of, say, information and communication technology, is going to get uh, twice as good uh, every 16 months, uh, and it's already 
much less expensive than actually doing an experiment. And so now you're using simulation to really accelerate and streamline your search or your experimental efforts. And uh, if we look at other examples, uh, say this is looking uh, at the resistivity of a monolayer of graphene, very much uh, uh, the topic of uh, today's talk, uh, as a function of temperature, as a function of doping. And you see the simulation on the left uh, and the experiments uh, done by Philip Kima when he was still at Columbia, uh, really, I would say, agree very well. And this is uh, what we call a multi-scale, multi-physics problem. We need to understand how electrons interact uh, with uh, uh, vibrations, uh, that is, what are the scattering rates, uh, how we sort of uh, um, telescope that to the mesoscale uh, with the Boltzmann transport equation, and at the end, how we get uh, the property of the device. Uh, going uh, more recent, uh, you know, this is optical readout of a qubit, a vacancy in two-dimensional boron nitride. Again, uh, we can predict uh, uh, the photoluminescence of, uh, you know, a complex novel two-dimensional materials uh, and in particular driven by the coupling of, in this case, uh, exciton and phonons. Or we can use uh, machine learning, a deep neural network in this case, uh, to learn quantum mechanics and be able to do simulations at time scale and length scales that we couldn't do with uh, brute force, uh, but where phenomena taking place uh, are still, uh, in this case, uh, too fast uh, and too shallow, because this is a system where only uh, the top uh, two atomic layers uh, melt uh, close to the bulk melting temperature uh, for an experiment uh, to actually be able to capture. Uh, we can engineer batteries, uh, we can engineer uh, solid state electrolytes, understand uh, what are the composition of a solid state materials uh, where lithium ions uh, move around as if they were in a liquid, and so we don't have to use uh, uh, you know, the flammable carbonates uh, that you have these days uh, in the batteries uh, in your laptop, uh, or if you are lucky, in your car uh, that every now and then uh, explodes. Uh, or we can work uh, with, say, experimental colleagues, uh, and we can do spectroscopic predictions of what uh, they see, and so we can you know, sort of link uh, the macroscopic spectroscopic signature uh, with uh, microscopic uh, geometries. So with, let's say, all of this, uh, uh, what we wanted to do, and you know, what I'm going to show you is how we put uh, all of this uh, to work uh, into this uh, sort of goal of uh, finding novel two-dimensional materials. Why do we care about uh, two-dimensional materials? Uh, we did some data mining, and we figured out uh, that uh, is a very good topic to get a Nobel Prize. So if you look at some of the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry, uh, there are quite a lot that are being given actually for the behavior of mostly electrons uh, in two dimensions. That's because uh, it's so unusual with respect to our three-dimensional world uh, that uh, novel uh, quantum mechanical phenomena arises here, the anomalous whole effect uh, or giant magnetoresistance or high TC superconductivity that was just uh, uh, discovered uh, uh, not very far away in Zurich or also Binning and Rohrer or Bernhard Murler, IBM and ETH respectively. Uh, and of course, you know all the story of uh, graphene uh, that had been uh, exfoliated uh, with scotch tape uh, by Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov. Uh, and uh, these days uh, can actually also be grown uh, with different uh, uh, technologies or uh, very often it can be exfoliated in the liquid phase. So what we wanted to do is uh, exactly what Geim and Novoselov had done, uh, that is uh, we wanted to exfoliate a piece of graphite uh, into graphene, but we wanted to do it uh, uh, with the computer and we wanted to do it uh, for all the materials that exist. So the first question, if you want, is how many materials uh, do we have? That is, how many, in this case, inorganic uh, compounds we have? Well, luckily, we have uh, uh, databases that have been collected uh, during the years. I think it's very relevant, I should point out, uh, uh, a Swiss uh, uh, effort that has been going on through the Pauling file uh, for 30 years. And uh, with 20 crystallographers in Lviv in Ukraine, basically reading uh, the literature, curating it, uh, and uh, passing it into their databases. And so these days, uh, we have a number of databases. These are uh, three of the major ones. Uh, 
roughly a million entries, but if we look at uh, uh, stoichiometric compounds, uh, uh, say with integer compositions, uh, no alloys, uh, no missing atoms, uh, basically we have uh, 84,000 different inorganic compounds. This is, if you want, our portfolio of materials. It's like uh, as if we were a pharma industry where they have maybe 10,000 molecules that have been approved for human consumptions and they are going to repurpose them. They are going to figure out if a molecule that is uh, uh, good for uh, you know, maybe some illness is going to be good for some other. Maybe thalidomide is actually good for myeloma, uh, even if uh, no one had tested it uh, before for that. So this is uh, our portfolio and uh, we are going to explore it. Uh, we are going to look uh, for uh, inorganic materials uh, uh, that are layered like this, uh, and uh, we are going to try and see if we can separate them into monolayer, characterizing uh, with computational quantum mechanics, the 3D parent, the two-dimensional children, or their basic properties, and then uh, looking for interesting applications. So we have done this, but this, these days, uh, uh, is an emerging uh, paradigm in research, and probably some of you have seen a very beautiful talk by Christian Thusen uh, on Monday here at uh, PASC uh, from DTU, where also they do uh, a lot of work in actually inventing novel 2D materials, so rather than looking for materials that are already known, looking uh, for novel materials. So we need to do this, and we need to do basically uh, a lot of calculations. So, so how do we proceed? First, uh, we want to you know, narrow down our database. Uh, and so what we did is uh, we should try to find uh, materials uh, that uh, look layered uh, according to standard geometrical criteria. So basically, we have the structure from our database, uh, and uh, we just link atoms uh, if the distance between two atoms uh, is smaller than the sum of their chemical so-called van der Waals radii uh, minus a certain tolerance parameter that we arbitrarily choose. So, you know, this delta could be half an angstrom, one angstrom, and uh, uh, we do this repeatedly for various values of delta, but for each delta we build uh, basically a connectivity and then we can figure out if the rank of this uh, connecting matrix is, uh, say, 3, 2, 1, or 0. That is, if it's 2, is a two-dimensional material. And if, you know, it looks like this, uh, any of these examples here, we set it aside for a quantum mechanical calculation, and uh, we do it uh, not only for a single value of delta, but uh, for a number of values uh, so that uh, we can, you know, as much as possible explore and get uh, all the candidates uh, that uh, we want uh, to investigate. And once we have done that, uh, we really need to calculate the properties that we want. Uh, we want to understand if it's stable, what kind of material it is, uh, and in our case, uh, uh, what is its uh, binding energy, its exfoliation energy. So we really need to go automatically uh, from an input that typically is a structure to an output that is a property, and uh, we want to do it uh, without any human intervention. So we need to build uh, the robust uh, computational workflows that bring us uh, from the beginning to the end. Uh, but we want to do that also, and that's very important, uh, preserving the entire structure of our workflow, preserving what is called uh, all the provenance of the data, so that uh, this is stored forever, you see as a directed acyclic graph, uh, that then we can also disseminate and queries in way that uh, I will describe. And so for this, and I'll go maybe back uh, at the end, uh, we started in 2013 with a group at PFL led by Giovanni Pizzi and a group at Harvard led by Boris Kozinski. We have been developing uh, this entire, I call it operating systems uh, for simulations in general, a Python framework uh, that we use to make sure that we can automatically run uh, thousands of calculations per day or even per hour on heterogeneous resources, and uh, everything uh, is collected and preserved in this uh, directed acyclic graph, so we have all the provenance of the graph of the data that we persist, 
And uh, the operating system does this for us. As scientists, uh, we really work in a high-level uh, workspace uh, where we build uh, the workflows. Uh, and not only that, uh, but we agree with the community at large uh, on what are the standards uh, uh, to push and pull data to open repositories. Uh, we'll go back into this uh, concept later on. But again, let me give you graphically you know, the sense of what happens in this uh, automated uh, workflows that we built on top of AIDA that we also built and that you know bring us again from a material to a property so we take uh, in this case uh, you know one uh, vanadate vanadium vanadium oxide compound from a database we transform that crystallographic information into say some standards we transform it uh, into a density functional theory calculation uh, where uh, we figure out uh, if our materials is insulating, if it's metallic, uh, if it's magnetic, and if it's magnetic, if it's ferro, antiferro, ferrimagnetic, what is its magnetic order? Uh, we calculate uh, the vibrations, the normal mode, the phonons, is it mechanically stable? Uh, we relax it, uh, and we do this uh, for the 3D parent, we do this uh, for the 2D child, and as I said, you know, once we have built uh, this entire structure, it can just run automatically and give us uh, you know, the properties that we want uh, without any human intervention. Not only that, uh, but it sort of prepares uh, not only the raw data in the form of this AIDA databases uh, with all the uh, provenance, but it also prepares uh, uh, you know, the data in a curated form that is human readable and that you can actually go, and I'll mention it later, on our dissemination platform, you can go to the Materials Cloud and actually look at all the results uh, that uh, I've been doing. As you can see, you know, the, the dream that is coming very soon is that actually it will also write uh, the paper, so we can just go finally on holiday permanently. Just to make sure that, you know, the, 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 the physics is good, the quantum mechanics is good, uh, uh, since the most important quantity that we want to calculate is the binding energy uh, of the layer, uh, what we had uh, were very uh, high quality reference uh, calculations uh, done with something that is called uh, adiabatic connection in the random phase approximation from Bjorkman and collaborators. These are the blue data, these are the binding energy uh, for around 25 materials. And uh, you know, when you use uh, Van der Waals density functional theory in green and orange, uh, I would say you have a very good agreement. It's not perfect, uh, but it's also incredibly uh, less uh, expensive. And if anything, uh, it uh, overestimates the binding energy. So in reality, the materials would have even lower binding energies than what we calculate. So this was the results of uh, our first effort, and this is actually uh, the paper for which we were uh, kindly awarded the Praise HPC Excellence um, Award. So we studied uh, with explicit uh, uh, computational quantum mechanics calculation uh, 5,619 materials. Uh, we did uh, roughly half a million uh, calculations, and the results are here. Um, every point, uh, this is a bit sparsified, but every point is basically one of those uh, 5,000 materials. And you see, you can sort of roughly cluster them into uh, yellow, green, and blue according to their, you see, binding energies. And for reference, uh, this is graphite. So 20 milliatron volt per angstrom square is the binding energy of graphene. You know? So this is what Gaim and Novozelov exfoliated. So on the, X -ax on the Y axis, uh, we have the binding energies. On the X axis, uh, we have the relevance of uh, Van der Waals interactions in those binding energies and these, these structures. So these are structures that are very much Van der Waals bound, and the more you move uh, to the left, uh, the more uh, other kind of chemical binding take place. But so our, uh, say, clustering tells us that basically all of a sudden, rather than having, uh, you know, the 20 or 30 exfoliable materials that were known at the time, uh, this came out in 2018, all of a sudden we have a thousand uh, blue materials uh, uh, that really are comparable to graphene in terms of binding energy, and we call them easily exfoliable. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, we find everything that is known. We find the transition metal decalcogenides, uh, we find the black phosphorus, uh, we find the compounds 
that the experimental community had been exfoliating. So there is a lot of validation in this. Um, we find the green material that are borderline. Uh, we knew and some of these uh, have been exfoliated uh, with something that is called uh, electrochemical intercalation. And then we find the uh, yellow materials uh, that are basically layered, but they are charge transfer. Uh, a lot of clays look like that. So even if they look layered, uh, you can't really just uh, uh, bring them down to the mono layers. What do they look like, these two-dimensional materials? We prototype them, so these are uh, the 10 uh, most common uh, prototypes. Uh, but you know, now it's a bit like being a kid in the candy store. Uh, we have gone from 20, 30 materials to 18, 25 uh, materials, close to 2,000 materials. Uh, what are we going to do? And these things uh, keeps growing. Uh, so for the past five years, uh, we keep searching, we keep uh, ingesting uh, new materials from new databases, and the database that we have uh, get updated every six months. I'll give you an example in a moment. So actually right now we stand with a portfolio of 3,000 inorganic compounds that can be exfoliated, and 2,000 that we have doubled what we have in uh, uh, 2018 are easily exfoliable. So what do we do? Here are a few examples of things that we could do, but we just don't have the time to do. Um, in, um, already in 2018, uh, we showed that there are a lot of 2D materials uh, uh, that can be magnetic metals or magnetic insulators. Uh, that in physics was a paradigm shift, uh, understanding that the magnetism can exist in 2D because it went against uh, a theorem uh, from David Mermin uh, from the late 60s, uh, uh, arguing that fluctuation will destroy magnetism. But a 2D material lives actually in three dimensions, so it's slightly different. So we find a lot of this, uh, we found things that could be good for spintronics. You see materials that have a large band gap in one spin and they are semiconductors in another spin. Uh, we find materials uh, that are metals. The Fermi energy, for those of you that are familiar with this concept, is uh, it's at zero here. So we have these metallic materials, uh, but uh, with the rest of the valence and the conduction very far away. So they could be interesting as transparent conductors. Uh, they could be interesting uh, for uh, low dissipation plasmonics. Um, these are some of the work that we have been doing. We have looking, been looking at some of these 2D materials uh, uh, as membranes, as sieves, uh, as uh, materials uh, for photovoltaics. Uh, a lot of these materials have uh, uh, what are called uh, charge density waves instability that have a nice interplay uh, with superconductivity. But some of these, the efforts are where uh, we have uh, gone more in detail uh, have been done. So this is an example, um, I think also very well known to the press community, our friend and colleague Mathieu Luzier here at ETH is an electrical engineer. He simulates devices. And you know, all of a sudden, we had this candy store of a lot of uh, novel two-dimensional materials that maybe, you know, could bring us next generation transistor beyond, uh, say, the FinFET paradigm. And so he calculated uh, with his techniques, uh, you know, all the properties of uh, devices uh, built uh, with, uh, uh, you know, an active channel uh, from 2D materials, identifying those that were promising for either uh, electron or hole on currents sort of somehow the demystifying the fact uh, that maybe transition uh, metal decalcogenides are not uh, very promising and, you know, analyzing uh, what are uh, the characteristics uh, that 2D materials need to have uh, to perform well in these basically short channel devices uh, where uh, the, the contact resistance is very important. A few examples that uh, I'm particularly fond because they were done uh, with uh, some of the master students uh, that we bring in with our center. This was done by Simran Kumari together with David, David Campi, identifying uh, the best uh, superconductors. These are Bardeen Cooper Schiffer superconductors, something that we can describe very well. They're not the high TC, let's say, of Bednarz uh, and Muller. And so here we have a prediction actually of uh, a critical temperature of 21 Kelvin. These are typically very accurate predictions. This material has been done uh, um, at uh, Los Alamos with high pressure synthesis. You see it's, uh, it's actually very beautiful, but these days there are fewer and fewer 
uh, experimental synthesis group. Somehow we have a bit lost uh, something that is very precious for our community. And we have colleagues here that are trying, but this is very difficult synthesis to make uh, the very ordered materials that then needs uh, to show the superconductivity. Another example, another inspired fellow, Rong Zhang from Singapore, uh, looking uh, at uh, uh, spin fat. And here there is uh, actually a slightly different paradigm in which uh, what we have are uh, a material, in this case was uh, lutetium oxide, that has uh, uh, very strong uh, local dipoles uh, while being uh, central symmetric. And so the gate voltage uh, can actually swap uh, these dipoles uh, and give rise to a very large uh, uh, Rajba splitting. Uh, another example, again, sort of, you know, I go very quickly, uh, but maybe looking at the future, I sort of uh, grew up scientifically, you know, looking at carbon nanotube as very promising uh, materials uh, for transistor, and you know how much it's been a nightmare to separate those in metallic and semiconducting one. But here, the nice thing is that uh, we can do for 1D materials, the same thing. That is, we can look at materials that can be exfoliated into one-dimensional wires, uh, giving us, uh, finally, you know, materials that have uh, a clean structure where we can look uh, for a large density of states, uh, for uh, you know, interconnects or vias that is being able uh, to bring a lot of currents uh, to our chips, uh, or materials that are semiconducting and can be field effect doped uh, exactly you know, giving us uh, what the nanotubes should have given us, uh, but without having to worry about not having a well-defined band gap. Let me conclude uh, with the last example that was uh, one of our earlier studies, uh, so if you want, is uh, uh, the more uh, complete one, uh, where uh, we looked uh, for topological in insulators, for quantum spinol insulators. So these are materials that uh, you know, topology has taken over solid state physics and condensed matter in the last 10 or 15 years. But because of the, say, differential geometry properties of the electronic state, of the electronic bands, end up having what we call protected states at the surface. And this would be two dimensional materials, so they would have uh, protected uh, uh, states uh, at the edge that would be very uh, robust and resilient uh, to disorder or uh, temperature. And uh, actually, the, the, the first idea about, uh, uh, say, this uh, topological model came from Duncan Haldane, that actually got the Nobel Prize in 2016 for his tight binding model at the end of an hexagonal lattice in the presence of a magnetic field. And then in 2005, Charlie Kane and Jean Millet sort of extended the Haldane paradigm uh, to get rid of the magnetic field, but just have a topological insulator driven by spin orbit coupling. So what we do, we have our 5,619 layered materials, 1825 exfoliable. We don't study materials contain lanthanides because it's actually still too complex to, in, um, to identify the magnetic structure and actually to be accurate in the magnetic structure, but on everything else, uh, we do our quantum mechanical calculations. For those of you that are expert uh, with spin orbit coupling, uh, we calculated the churn invariance. And if a material looks promising, we do many body perturbation theory uh, to calculate correctly the band structure. And so out of all of this, uh, basically, uh, most of the materials are actually green and boring, uh, but the ones uh, with the red circles are interesting. They are quantum spinol insulators. Some of them were already known, like bismuthin, but they are impossible to deal with experimentally. Some of them were already known, but have a comparatively small band gap. And there was something that was very interesting, never been discussed, and with a large band gap. That's very important for room temperature operation. What is this compound? Well. This is a compound that is called Jacutin gate that had been discovered in 2008. Uh, there was an expedition, a Czech crystallography expedition, looking for novel minerals. This is uh, in Minas Gerais, uh, where there are a lot of uh, iron mines, and so looking in the iron ore for new materials. And they found uh, not only the well-known pla well platinum selenide, but they found uh, this uh, new mineral 
based on Mercury. Um, so very happily they published it in the Canadian Mineralogist. I don't know if any of you read uh, this, uh, this journal, but luckily, you know, our database uh, ingesters uh, read it, uh, put it in the database, and so it was part of the materials that we studied. And this material look actually exactly like graphene. You see this hexagonal lattice of uh, mercury atoms, but they are very heavy, so the spin-orbit coupling is very important. And if we do state-of-the-art calculation of the band gap uh, with many body perturbation theory, uh, this material is actually a huge band gap, half an electron volt, uh, and uh, you see these uh, are actually the edge metallic bands, uh, so it's a topological material in the bulk, uh, but with these uh, bands. Uh, the detail here becomes uh, a bit technical, but this turned out to be actually the first uh, and the only one ever topological material uh, that actually embodies uh, uh, the physics that was envisioned in 2005 uh, by Charlie Cale and Jean Millet. Uh, most of the, uh, not most, all topological material rely on a different band inversion paradigms by Zhang and Bernevik and others. Uh, but this really uh, uh, embodies uh, the Cale and Millet uh, next nearest neighbor spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian that Ted envisioned. So we got very excited. And so before uh, sort of, you know, trying to approach our experimental colleagues, uh, we did some more computational material science. We looked at the formation energy of defects to make sure that it was actually possible to synthesize this. Uh, we looked, uh, say, at the absorption of oxygen, water, water attack, to make sure that, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a material that you only deal in a glove box, uh, and actually everything uh, looked, uh, looked uh, promising. Uh, and so we convinced uh, our colleagues uh, in uh, Geneva, Enrico Giannini, to do uh, the experiment, uh, Christoph Renner doing UC the STM, and so uh, the material uh, looked, uh, looked actually beautiful, and Felix Baumberger did uh, the uh, ARPES and synchrotron measurement, uh, finding exactly uh, the topological state uh, that we had predicted. So this is, if you want, the magic uh, of computational quantum mechanics uh, that, uh, you know, most of the time is actually able to reproduce reality. Luckily, not always, otherwise uh, we would be all unemployed. And uh, these days there is actually uh, a lot of uh, excitement. There has actually been uh, the recent uh, sort of discovery that this material uh, is also a superconductor for those of you in the field in three dimension, as also dual topology. So this uh, concludes most of my story. I have still five minutes to tell you a little bit more about the infrastructure. But so this was exactly the paper for which uh, we were kindly given the award. And uh, sort of tongue in cheek, there is a famous citation from Richard Feynman about nanotechnology. There is plenty of room at the bottom. And here at the top, uh, we are just exfoliating these materials for novel properties. And uh, we keep doing it, and it's uh, you know powering uh, a number of research efforts in the group. So if I, I do, I have five minutes. Or so let me actually conclude maybe uh, more broadly, and uh, this uh, maybe goes beyond uh, material science and computational material science. Uh, is about uh, you know science and uh, the kind of computational science that we all do, and uh, how you know. In my view, and in the view of many of you, is moving towards, uh, say, uh, a digital infrastructure that is, uh, if you want, uh, the counterpart for computational science of what uh, our big installation, experimental installation worldwide are. So, you know, we have synchrotrons, we have accelerator, uh, we have radio telescopes, uh, we have, you know, telescope in the sky, we have synchrotrons. Uh, uh, and I think uh, more and more, exactly as uh, we have uh, supercomputing centers and hardware, we really need to think at the entire infrastructure that goes around this. So if I think at my laboratory, I actually think uh, at the codes, at the software. Uh, we ourselves uh, contribute a lot uh, to some of these codes, uh, say Quantum Espresso. We work very clear, closely here with CSCS and the Sirius code uh, to be able to run uh, on, say, accelerated hardware, and in general, we have uh, uh, an ecosystem of uh, computational quantum mechanics code uh, that are really the quantum engine to power all the science that we do. And then, as I told you, we have built uh, on top of this, this layer, this AIDA operating system to empower the kind of high-throughput simulation 
with data provenance and workflows that uh, uh, I showed you. And naturally, you know, this combination of, uh, let's say, automated, uh, I call them turnkey simulation tools, uh, means that now we can expose uh, the non-specialist uh, to these capabilities. Uh, that is, we can have uh, other uh, colleagues, we can have experimental colleagues, uh, we can have students uh, access these tools uh, uh, without, uh, you know, the barrier that comes uh, from the infinite technicalities that you all know are needed to deploy optimally a code on, uh, say, a new hardware, but also just run uh, these complex simulations. And not only that, but we have also the power to actually disseminate that uh, on the cloud. I told you already about uh, AIDA and, uh, you know, this focus on pushing automated automation and data towards the operating system so that humans can happily live in this green uh, pillar where they build uh, the scientific workflows, the data analytics in this high-level workspace and make sure that we can push and pull data to public uh, repositories. Now, you know, this is just a small demonstration of the high throughput capabilities. Uh, uh, the Lumi Consortium was kind enough uh, to give us a, a pilot, both on their CPU ma machine and the, their future GPU machine. This is one of the three pre-exascale architectures in Europe. So we had uh, for 12 hours the entire machine, again, like being in a candy store, uh, 200,000 cores. Uh, uh, but you see, what is remarkable is not only that we were able to run 55,000 density functional theory calculation, but basically, you know, we were able to really optimally use this entire machine. And it's not only sort of, you know, using every single cycle running on this. This is a dream for me. But also, all of this is stored. So all of this has been, um, you know, accomplished accurately because the workflows are tuned to make sure that the results are reliable. They can uh, correct uh, on the fly the vast majority of errors. Uh, but basically, everything that we have done is now stored and is very useful and it has a sort of properties that we need for our search of new materials. And uh, AIDA per se, just from a workstation, uh, could actually monitor hundred thousands of calculation per hour, again, keeping all those provenance uh, graph. Also, another thing, just, uh, you know, this is a recent effort uh, um, providing, uh, say, universal uh, workflows uh, to be able to calculate uh, the same uh, property with very different quantum engines. Those of you that are in quantum chemistry or in computational material science uh, will recognize, uh, sorry, uh, um, quantum chemistry code like Gaussian or Orca, uh, computational material science code, uh, say, like uh, CASTEP or VASP that are commercial solution open source solutions like uh, Quantum Espresso and WCAM, CP2K that is developed uh, here in Switzerland, all electron pseudo-potential code. And now you can run uh, basic calculations, uh, in this case just the equation of state or the dissociation of a molecule, without knowing any of the details of this code, uh, just uh, swapping in and out uh, uh, the quantum engine that you want. And so all this capability of uh, as I said, making a, a calculation uh, automated and usable means that we can also deploy calculation in a lab. This is an example at the EMPA, the Materials Laboratory uh, in Dubendorf, uh, close to uh, Zurich. And this is an experimental group. They're using a CP2K in fairly sophisticated ways. You see using many body perturbation theory, GW with image correction, to predict uh, what would be the IV characteristics uh, or the STM images, in this case of nanoribbons that solves uh, on metal surfaces and compare and understand uh, their experiments. Now, the, and this is the last uh, slides. Uh, I mean, so all of this uh, not only is used, uh, say, at the group level, but actually powers uh, our entire dissemination platform. That is something that you can go around and play around, what we call the materials cloud, that is actually deployed, uh, say, at CSCS, that is our infrastructure as a service provider. And uh, you would see here these front ends uh, where you can find, uh, say, all the data of these 2D calculations, uh, either as an archival record or as a 
curated uh, interactive front end or you can uh, you know, look at the entire uh, mm, graph uh, database. I think uh, I'll uh, skip these last uh, two slides, but you can play around. If you want to look at these 2D materials, you can go on the materials cloud and, uh, and uh, mm, um, download anything that you want, and the entire databases are actually on the archive. And I often say, you know, in Europe we use the word fair very often, and I think we are, you know, even beyond fair, and uh, this is the archival entry for the uh, 2D database. So I think uh, I see Laura sort of ready to get up. So uh, I think I am at the conclusion. Uh, maybe I'll just flash them. On one side, uh, you know, HPC, high performance computing, but also high throughput computing are really accelerating our capability to do design and discovery. And, uh, you know, all of this is built. Uh, on top of uh, computational science that I think is one of the most uh, fascinating uh, scientific endeavors uh, of, this, uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this century. So I'll just uh, thank uh, the team. These are the 10 people that did the work with me. As you can see, they've all moved uh, to independent positions all over the world. Uh, very proud of them. Actually, they had made at the time uh, a little joke on being uh, 11 of us. I think I get to be George Clooney. Uh, this is the group uh, in EPFL and somehow scattered around the world. Um, and, you know, all of this is really possible because, and that's incredibly important, long-term funding. You can't do this kind of efforts with, you know, sort of short-term grant. And, of course, the computational resources that PRACE has given us and also CSCS has given us during the years. So with this, I let you with the New Yorker and thanks for your time and thanks again for the confidence. Thank you, Nicola, for this great and inspiring talk. We are ready to take questions for Nicola. And I can also take the questions remotely. So let me start with a question. So do you think AIDA could be extended to be used by other uh, application domains? Yeah, so it was built uh, not uh, with uh, computational material science in mind in any way. So it has a plug-in mechanism by which it can be interfaced uh, with uh, any code. Uh, you know, some of notable examples go from industry. Uh, Microsoft is deploying it on Azure, so there is a Microsoft uh, AIDA GitHub uh, repository. Sintef in Norway uses for their uh, high throughput efforts. But there are now efforts where, say, uh, at EMPA, they are you know, working with uh, AIDA to sort of enable their meteorological workflows. Or we are using it as an orchestrator uh, for uh, uh, robotic experiments. Uh, so exactly as you know, you, you want to engage, uh, say, computational drivers mm -hmm. and robots, uh, AIDA now can keep track of everything. So I think, uh, you know, I see the very bright future. Again, my goal is to retire early and go on holiday where, you know, everything happens on its own. And we are almost there. <laughs> Thank you. So a question here. So in 2018, when we first met, I was, I talked to you because I had a whole bunch of life sciences friends who said that they started looking at databases. And you said, yeah, sure, AIDA, that, you know, we're talking to life sciences. I haven't seen much happening yeah, in not, that space. So, and uh, not as far as I know, I have had some very nice conversation with Eric Lindahl that is also very much involved in the European environment. I mean, at the end, you know, we can't or don't want even to push. and. As all complex tools, uh, you know, there is also uh, a learning barrier, uh, you know, in order to, 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 uh, um, to get actually to reap the benefits. Uh, um, and it's also, you know, as much as, you know, I'm in awe of what the computational biochemistry community has done is not my community. So, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, it's just, there is not much happening as far as I know. Uh, but there is a, you know, there is a lot of educational material, tutorials, uh, uh, there are hackathons, uh, all of this is recorded on the web. I mean, if you look at the AIDA website, uh, you find a lot of material. So we try to make uh, uh, the entry point as uh, simple as possible. 
Other questions? Yes, up there. Nicola, so thanks for the talk. Great. Uh, a question. Thanks so for these serious. materials that you explore, they are in this con condensed this crystallographical databases. They are discovered. Is there an effort to like to try to find the theoretically stable materials that do not exist yet? And yeah. Yeah, so that is, it, it's actually a very healthy effort. Christian Tuzen uh, on Monday uh, actually presented some of their work at DTU in Lingby in Denmark, uh, including uh, some uh, machine learning generative models. Um, and in general, there is uh, a lot of effort uh, in uh, structure prediction. It's been incredibly successful for high pressure materials uh, already in the 2000, uh, you know, because uh, uh, it's very difficult to do experiment at 300 gigapascal and it's impossible to do at 600 gigapascal. So there have been many successes. There are even recent papers on the archive on this, you know, forever problem of understanding at which temperature, sort of, at which pressure and in which structure hydrogen metallizes or superconducts. Um, now, thermodynamic stability is very subtle in the sense that in order to understand if a material can exist, it needs to have a free energy that is more stable than all its possible decomposition product. And so those are very tiny energy differences between structures that have very different chemistry and coordination. So I sort of stayed away just because there is an inherent risk in saying, you know, this material looks stable according to the calculation, but, you know, we have accuracy limits we need to calculate also vibrational free energy. There are a lot of properties that have to come together. And then we also need to get a synthesis route. But in general, there are very many efforts. One of, you know, not one, there are several in the United States, the Materials Project in Berkeley, the uh, OQMD in uh, Northwestern, uh, AFLO in Duke. So it's a very lively, uh, it's a very lively field. I, I tend to, you know, stay maybe with materials that exist uh, and calculate properties that are complex. Other questions? Yes. So, Nicola, also thank you from my side for the nice talk. I have one question. What do you think is the biggest barrier for kind of the last mile to have a broad adoption of these tools by experiments in companies? Um, so, I think the last miles requires a lot of human effort to make uh, tools uh, easy and user-friendly. I remember the founder of Dropbox uh, that says, you know, the idea is very simple, but then, you know, we have to spend years and a huge amount of resources to make sure that everything happens uh, straightforwardly. And it's not clear even if, uh, you know, the academic and public uh, way is the right answer. You know, that's why there are companies, that's why there are software companies, you know, from Gaussian to VASP that do exactly this. So somehow, you know, my business proposition here is that uh, what we want to do is really to push uh, the capabilities that are very much needed but cannot be fulfilled by a commercial company for the, you know, cutting edge research. What a free electron laser needs uh, from the point of view of simulation is not something uh, that a company will do. But when you spend a hundred million dollars, francs, euros in a free electron laser, it might make sense uh, to invest a fraction of that uh, in the scientific software that is needed to understand uh, what is happening. With this, let's thank Nicola again.